Good evening, sisters. How are you guys doing tonight? We're excited, warm enough, cold enough. The weather's been up, down, all over the place, and so I can't even really tell. But I'm excited for Women's Midweek, and I'm excited to be able to preach tonight. What an honor, what a treat. And as I was preparing for my lesson, one of the things that I was thinking about was my mom and her gift of storytelling. And I loved growing up just hearing and sitting at her feet, just hearing the stories that she had to tell. And sometimes she would tell you the same ones, but if you cut her off and told her that you already heard it, she would cut you off and continue to tell it, you know? And I loved it because it was hilarious. And so I would pretend it was like the first time I would hear it. But when we think of stories, oftentimes the stories that we hear are of these heroic feats, right? Or of these morals. But the story that we're going to look at tonight is a little different, and some would say a little less grand. And we're going to look at a story of a woman that Jesus wanted everyone to remember. And the title of my lesson tonight is In Memory of Her. In memory of her, we're going to turn over to Matthew 26. When we think of some of the things that we want to be remembered for, I know that there are a lot of nursing students in the audience and some nurses as well, opportune, um, as well as a few other people. And so for nursing, wanting to be known for caring for people, right, for your patients and for pouring yourself out. There's a lot of women who are aspiring women's ministry leaders who want to help save souls and be in the full-time ministry. Quite a few athletes and track stars that want to be known for their discipline and their work ethic. A lot of incredible mothers, physical and spiritual, known for their care and their compassion for the flock. But we're going to look at a woman, and her name is Mary of Bethany. And in Matthew 26, we're going to see what Jesus wanted her to be remembered for. In Matthew 26, verse 1, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is in two days and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And so this is two days before the Passover, which is a holiday to celebrate how God freed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. And he is in Bethany, which is a small village about two miles from Jerusalem. And it's also home to some of his best friends, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. In John 12, verse 2, it tells us that there was a dinner being held there in honor of Jesus. And those people were present. But we also know that there was a warrant for Jesus' arrest and a death threat. And yet we see him reclining at the table, enjoying the dinner party. And you could just see the peace as he trusted in God despite the imminent crucifixion that was facing him. But I want to look at a few qualities of Mary and what she was remembered, remembered for. And so point number one, remembered for her stillness. Remembered for her stillness. 
In John 11, verse 5, Jesus tells us that he loved Mary, Martha, and her sister. Well, he loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. And there's actually three different instances of Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. She anoints and wipes his feet in John 12. In Luke 10, it says that she sat at his feet listening to his teachings. And so there's a connection between Mary and Jesus' feet. And in the Jewish tradition, when you sat at someone's feet, it was what a disciple did. And so in Acts 22, it talks about how the apostle Paul was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. And he was later described as a Pharisee of Pharisees being trained under his tutelage. And so Mary sitting at Jesus' feet denotes that he's her rabbi, he's her teacher, and that Jesus welcomes women to sit at his feet and to learn from him. If we go over to Luke chapter 10, you'll remember the story of Mary and Martha. And this is one of the instances where she sits at his feet. In Luke 10, verse 38, remembered for her stillness. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. I've been there. I'm like, don't you see what they're not doing? Help me. I need help. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. And so oftentimes we can read this scripture and we can think, okay, so does a disciple sit at Jesus' feet, or does a disciple serve? And it can be an opposing question. And so while this seems like the main point that this passage is teaching, there's a deeper meaning that lies in verse 39. In the Greek, the word kai, which is translated into English as also, is more literally translated as she had a sister called Mary who also having sat at the feet of the Lord was listening to his word. And so what that means is that it either meant that Mary also served, that Martha also sat at his feet, or both of them were able to do it. It was just that in this instance, Martha was not sitting at his feet, but was instead distracted. And so it's not do you sit or do you serve, but it's being able to do both, sitting and serving. And so we see that her sitting wasn't being unmoving, you know, unwilling to give, unwilling to to do anything, but she was listening specifically to the direction that Jesus gave her while Martha was distracted. And the word distracted, it means to be drawn away, to be driven about mentally, to be over-occupied. Very literally, it means to be dragged and pulled in different directions, And it made Martha feel alone and self-righteous. And yet with Mary, what we saw, there was a purity to her love. There was a purpose in sitting at his feet. There was a firm conviction and a faith in her relationship with God, with what she was doing while she was sitting there. And she was humble enough to sit at his feet. She valued the intimacy that she got from him. She wasn't anxious. She wasn't trying to take control. She was simply trying to learn from her teacher. And so, sisters, I ask you tonight, what distracts and pulls you away from Jesus? Is it work, school, family, our thoughts, our desires? And what is the result when you're distracted by these things? Is it resentment? Is it grumbling, I don't want to take on more, I can't do more? Is it not seeing that the survey too, that we're, the serving that we're doing is for God? Now we just start to see like it's for people. It's because my husband needs me to. It's because my kids asked me to. Do we start protecting ourselves as though God hurt us? 
I can't give more. I need to fight for this. And have you been hearing from Jesus in your times with him? I want to lift up Donna because over, over the, the winter break, she gave me this book called Whisper. And in it, it talks about how to hear from God and how the most dangerous prayer you could ever pray is speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And so I've been praying that prayer in my prayer walks. And it's been scary, guys. It's scary the things that the Lord has to tell me and the things that I have to do. But it's so inspiring because sometimes we can pray and we can do all the talking and fail to hear from God. And yet in stillness, we get to hear from him and we prioritize that. And so I just want to lift up a few women as well in the audience who sat at Jesus' feet and then made Jesus Lord of their lives. First, I want to lift up Corazon. And so Corazon is a teen disciple that just got baptized this past Sunday. And in talking to her, one of the things that she said, like, she became a disciple because of just how much Jesus did for her. And even in her Bible studies, just being able to fall in love with who he is and being able to overcome. I'm so proud of you, Corazon. Another sister I want to lift up is Kaylin. <laughs> So every single Bible study that Kaylin did, she just came in tears, just so amazed by God and so amazed specifically how his power can be strong in her weakness. And so it's so encouraging to see her join our singles ministry. And I can't leave out Amaya. <laughs> Amaya and her heart have truly transformed the depth of her love and the forgiveness because of the time that she sat at Jesus' feet and saw just how much he forgave her. And to see you become a disciple and to transform, it's so incredible and so encouraging. But it's not just them. We have several other women here tonight, including Natasha, who, Lord willing, will get baptized at the end of service. And these past couple of weeks, she's just been sitting at Jesus' feet, and it's so amazing. She was telling me her mom's like, another Bible study, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because it's a lot of time in the Word. And yet I've seen her come out as a woman of deep conviction, sharing her faith and helping other women as well. And so I'm so excited for you. And so if you're a visitor tonight and you're wondering, like Brianna was saying, what is this, you know, this is an opportunity to sit at Jesus' feet. I want to encourage you to ask the person who invited you out to join a personal Bible study to really get to know Jesus through his word in an intimate way. But also for disciples, is there stillness in your service? Maybe we're feeling weak and overwhelmed, like there's no break. We're the only ones cleaning and cooking. I can feel that way. It's a feeling, but I can feel that way, you know. And sometimes we can go back to dealing with our emotions and our lives the way that we did in the world by doing the silent treatment, by just working and just crossing things off our to-do list without praying first, without asking for help and strength from God, by giving into bitterness and anxiety, by putting consequences, saying, like, I'll forgive, but you have to do this and this and this in order to earn my grace back. Like, there can be so many different ways that we can deal with the, the craziness going on around us. But I want to encourage you to go back to Jesus' feet, to go back to the immense gratitude that you felt for being saved. Um, and in our prayers, being able to pray that scary prayer, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And whatever it is that he reveals to you, having the humility to do it. Mary was remembered for her stillness. Point number two, remembered for giving up everything. Let's go back to Matthew 26. Remembered for giving up everything. And I love that I get to preach to quite a bit of Mary's tonight. You guys are amazing, and I love the way that you guys love the Lord and teach me. In Matthew 26, we'll go back to our pillar scripture in verse 7. I always forget to drink water when I'm up here, so let me take a sip while you guys turn. Matthew 
Matthew 26, verse 7. The Bible reads, A woman came to him with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you always have, but you won't always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached, what she has done will also be told. And I appreciate this scripture because in the Mark account, in Mark 14, verse 8, it says that she did what she could. And now an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume was worth about 300 denarii. So if you were to calculate it to our modern time, that's about $71,296. Now we understand why Judas was so upset, you know. And in those days, people would show honor or love to someone by anointing them with oil or perfume, depending on the occasion. And so she was showing her love to Jesus in the way that she understood how, by anointing his head with this perfume. In John's account, it says that she also anointed his feet, and the fragrance filled the whole house. And anointing with oil is actually represented quite a few times in the Bible as God's blessing on a person or a healing a person. And we also know that Jesus washed his disciples' feet as well, a demonstration of sacrificial love and service. And so we see that Mary valued him, but this is not something that's easily understood. And it can be how people in the world view our giving, right? This is a waste. You're giving this much money to the church? This is what your tithe is? What is the special missions thing? And it can be so difficult for them to understand just how much we value the opportunity that we have to be a part of building up God's kingdom. This is not just an average church. We are part of a restoration movement that is trying to restore biblical Christianity. And so part of that is spreading the gospel and making disciples of all nations. And I think an incredible woman that I want to lift up that embodies and um, emulates this heart is our sister Beignet. I don't know if everyone's gotten a chance to just hang out with Beignet, but man, you will walk out way more encouraged than you could ever encourage her. Beignet is a special part of our body, a special part of our church, our sisterhood, and she has a chronic sickness. But when you look at her, she's just constantly smiling. Every text message thread, Auntie Lisa, let me join the Women of Wisdom thread. And I just see the encouragement from all of the women and her encouragement specifically. I love talking to her. She's just so much fun. She's so consistent in her giving. But one thing she said, ah, that just really moved my heart. It was during one of our special missions turn-ins last year, and she said, I wish I had more to give. She's on fixed income, you know, and she doesn't have much, but you could just tell, like, this is where her treasure is. And I just see so much of Mary's heart in Beignet. And so I just want to encourage us to, one, just get some time with her because she's amazing. (laughs) But then, two, does our time and our money show what we value the most? And is that valuing the kingdom? And I just wanna encourage us to really prioritize and let's start giving towards our special missions. If you wanna do it little by little or however you wanna make it happen, but to blow out our pledges for God so that we can continue to be part of this valuable work. She was remembered for giving up everything. And our last and final point, is about Judas. Ooh. Dun, dun, dun. Matthew 26, verse 14. And the Bible reads, 
Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Point number three, remembered for his love growing cold. Remembered for his love growing cold. And so has anyone watched The Chosen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I learned a lot from The Chosen. It's not Bible, but it fills in quite a few of the blanks. And so I always wondered, like, why Judas joined the ministry, you know, because I'm like, if you weren't really about it, like, what was it? But it was because he thought that this kingdom was going to take over the world, that he was joining this extravagant venture where there was going to be a lot of glory and riches and fame. And so he gave up his job in order to, to make money here. And so imagine how he felt hearing of Jesus talking about, yeah, I'm about to die soon. Yeah, my time's almost come to an end. Yeah, it's, it's almost over. And then seeing just how sacrificial the disciples were and just caring for people. And he's like, this doesn't make any financial sense. And so what happened is even though he was walking beside Jesus, he started to allow the love of money and the greed in his heart to actually harden his heart towards God. And his love of money grew into a selfishness that hardened into a hatred for Jesus. And so even though he had the title of a disciple, he couldn't understand the love that moved Mary's heart or her heartfelt devotion. In Matthew 24, verse 12, the Bible reads, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. And if we read the account in John 12, verse 4 to 6, it talks about how he wasn't even trying to give the money to the poor like he said he was, but he was actually taking some of the money from the pot for himself, right? So he only saw the monetary value of the perfume and what he could have profited from it. And he couldn't see what God was doing in his life or the lives of the people around him. Some commentators even believe that Judas felt offended, And he felt humiliated. And that's why he decided that, okay, that's the final straw. I'm going to act in revenge. But you know what's interesting, and I've never picked up on this before. It was this woman's generosity that actually exposed his heart. It was seeing someone who was actually committed, who understood the value of what was happening, that exposed the greed, the pride, the lukewarmness in his heart. And so, sisters, what is God using tonight to expose your heart? Is it annoying seeing people happy (laughs) or joyful? Um, I know sometimes even for me it can be hard to see people have what I want. You know, and that exposes my heart, the envy, whether it's of people's talents or time. And so how can we tell if our love is growing cold? So the other day, um, I was watching my wife and kids. I don't know if anybody's watched it. Yeah, so it's one of my um, shows from my childhood, I guess, is the best way to explain it. But there's, a ma- there's two main characters, two protagonists. One is called Michael Kyle, who's the super alpha business owner dad. And then you have his wife, Jay. And Jay creates this day called Sweetheart's Day to get Michael to get her diamonds. That's the whole objective of this day. She wants diamonds. And so she creates this day. And he's just like, this doesn't make any sense. And she's like, you better, you know. And so he goes to the store to buy her some diamonds. And the store attendant is showing him different options and asking him if he wants something gold or platinum and all these different things, and he doesn't know. So he calls her. But Jay just had a really long day. And so she's watching all the kids. She's tired from serving and all these different things. And so she picks up the phone. She's like, what do you want? And she's not the most loving and gentle and quiet in that moment, right? And so he's like, no, 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 it's okay. And so instead of getting her the diamonds, he gets her the cheapest option. I know every sister is just like, oh, no. 
it does not go well for him. Not only that, he goes and he advises his son and his daughter's boyfriend to do the same. Right before you get their gift for Sweetheart's Day, call them. And depending on how they react, rate them from 1 to 10. And that's the value of the gift you get them. And so come grand reveal time, all of the guys didn't listen to him. And they got great gifts. But he did not get a great gift for his wife. And so he shows her the gift that he got her, and she is livid. At first, she's, like, thankful and grateful, like, no, okay, like, no, it's awesome. But then one of the guys was like, yeah, Mrs. Kyle, it's because right when he called you, you said this, and so he returned it. And she was like, what? And they have a very interesting conversation because she gets a little petty. He walks into the room. She goes, that was it, too. He does something nice for her. She goes, a four. And so he's mad that he's getting rated on everything that he's doing, but he rated her on her attitude in that moment. And she talks to him, and she's like, Michael, that wasn't fair that you judge the value of what you gave me based on a single moment. What would you have rated me birthing our three kids? What would you have rated me staying loyal by your side as you were balding? (laughs) What would you have rated? She said that, it's true. What would you have rated me working or me staying with the kids all day and working all night as you got your business off the ground? It was not fair that you judged the value of our marriage into this single moment. And yet, how often can we judge the value of our relationship with God based on the last prayer he did or he did not answer? How much can we value how much our sister or our husband loves us based on the last thing they told us or the way they did or did not consider us? And so sometimes our love grows cold, and it's from these little moments that we put a lot of value on that are not actually indicative of the big picture. It can sound like ultimatums. You either do this or else. It can start out as complaints and creep into slander and become discord, dissensions, and factions. It can be not getting open about your sin and hardening your heart towards others. Having a critical eye that becomes a critical heart. It's going back to impurity or to your Egypt past relationships because of the present loneliness that you feel. It can be having a contemptuous attitude towards leadership because you're seeing more of what's going on. It's learning, it's choosing to not be family and sit together and be unified because of wanting to to just protect yourself and self-preserve. It's being critical about the battle, but not being in the battle. And yet what's crazy about all of this, I'm sure it was a, a, a progression for Judas, but Jesus didn't actually judge him. He didn't even punish him. Judas punished himself. Judas left the movement because he didn't want to give missions and he didn't want others to give. And he was more concerned about finances than their heart. But Jesus didn't even punish him. What that means is his story didn't have to end there and our story doesn't have to end here. Even if our love gets cold, it doesn't have to stay cold. And I appreciate 2 Corinthians 12 verse 8 through 10 where it talks about how God's power is made perfect in weakness. When we see a weakness in our lives and in in, in the things that we're doing, it's an opportunity for God to get a lot of glory. That's all that it is. And I appreciate it because when you look up the words about weakness, what it says is an illness, suffering, calamity, or a frailty. So a situation where you feel weak or delicate or sensitive, right? And it says that the grace that becomes sufficient is a favor 
that is not deserved that grants pardon for your offenses. A grace that is not deserved but that offers pardon for your offenses. And so Jesus sees your weakness and he wants to cover over it if we go to him. And I just appreciate that about God. And in Psalm 73, verse 25, we see Jesus say, or David say, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I love that you guys are reading this along with me. Because we see that the value of what God gives us and we can respond in kind with our hearts. And so happily, Michael Kyle repents, you know, on this show. And he realizes that he shouldn't have done that. And he throws this elaborate dinner. He allows, um, he gets babysitting for the kids, and he just spoils his wife. And he's like, honestly, it shouldn't have taken this day for me to value you anyways. Like, every day I should treat you like this, you know? And how much more every day, the way that we get to show our love, not just to God, but to his people, you know, so that we're not remembered for our love growing cold, but we're remembered for just an increasing amount of love. And so in closing, sisters, what do you want to be remembered for, right? Um, Brianna was sharing this story with me about someone who shared this with her, <laughs> a sister's cousin's uncle's daughter, friend, that shared this story with her that at a funeral, there was an incredible woman who was known, who was an incredible lawyer, but when everyone shared about her, not a single person mentioned her career, they focused on her character, her kindness, her patience, her perseverance. And for us sisters, we can be known for our love for God, for our stillness in God, for our sacrifice for God, and for our love for God. And in the same way that this woman's story was told, Judas's story is also told. And so we get to pick the story that's told about us. And with that, to God be the glory.